There we go. Okay, so let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to our community event. So as you all know, today we're hosting a panel discussion on how researchers and entrepreneurs and practitioners can collaborate for evidence-driven ed tech design and implementation. So today we're hosting this event in collaboration with ESSA, who is a research organization committed to improving the use of evidence and data on education from Africa. And we have Lucy, the CEO, with, uh, with us here today. So um, just a few things for those who uh, may not know me. My name is Silvia. I'm a community manager at EdTech Hub. So my job here is to create opportunities for you all to connect and to basically make the most out of the knowledge, the support, and the expertise in this uh, amazing EdTech community. And yeah, just before we start, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, we're excited to have all of you here today uh, because we know how valuable it is to network and to take part, uh, part in conversations about the latest in EdTech. And so, yeah, we're just like, happy to provide the space for you so that you, can share, so that you can share your knowledge and experience and make connections. So as we've seen in the chat before, we're joining from all over the world. So it's great to have like a diverse group here uh, with us today. So to give you a little overview of what today looks like. Um, so we're going to have a panel discussion with the great panelists that we have here today, moderated by Lucy, and we're going to have a brief Q&A at the end. And just to give you a sense of who's in the room here today, we have the entrepreneur and practitioners from the EdTech Hub Sandboxes, we have the alumni from our EdTech Evidence for Entrepreneurs course, and we have the researchers uh, affiliated with ESSA. Uh, and so the panel that we have here today, as you can see, sort of like represents this community, as we have both researchers that have made important findings in education, and we also have EdTech entrepreneurs and practitioners that have incorporated um, research into their innovations. So the goal that we have here today is to basically have a meaningful conversation about the um, intersection of EdTech research and implementation. And so that hopefully we can also inspire connections and collaboration across the spectrum. So one last uh, quick housekeeping tip before we start, um, please stay on mute during the panel. And if you have any questions or reflections uh, or thoughts, you can drop them in the chat um, so we can pick them up uh, later in the Q&A. So that's it for me. Um, I'll let Lucy and the panelists introduce themselves and dive into the panel. So Lucy, uh, over to you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Sylvia. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be with you all here um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. So it's very common these days to hear about hear people talk about the need to be evidence based or evidence driven. Um, the idea that innovations must be backed by credible research and tested to ensure their effectiveness and maximize impact is widely accepted. Um, the field of edtech has in the past perhaps had a bit of a reputation for not taking research too seriously, scaling rapidly without deep understanding of context or waiting for evidence from implementation. Um, in their turn, researchers have often been viewed as lacking understanding of the needs and timescales of the tech world. Um, but times are ch definitely changing and edtech entrepreneurs are increasingly undertaking their own research in-house or partnering with academics or research institutions. This is leading to innovations that are better adapted to context, more cost effective and improving learning for more young people. So today we're going to hear from both entrepreneurs and researchers experienced in the field of edtech to talk about what makes an effective collaboration from both technical considerations to promoting a positive relationship. And it's a real expert now, a real pleasure now, sorry, for me to turn to our expert panel. Um, I'm going to first ask, our, introduce our guests from the research world. I'm going to ask our um, our researchers to briefly introduce themselves and say what it is about the world of edtech that is exciting for them from a research perspective. Um, so I'm going to ask first uh, Dr. Moses Naguare, then Dr. Mayna, and then Dr. Might, if I could ask you each to not take more than a minute to answer that question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 
Lucy, my name is Moses Nguare. It's a pleasure being here and thank you for the invitation. I am a researcher with the African Population and Health Research Center in Nairobi. I dilute the Education and Youth Empowerment Research Unit, as well as the Human Development Unit that conducts research within the education in Sub-Saharan Africa. Going straight to your question on what, uh, let me put it differently, what excites me when I hear of EdTech vis-a-vis -vis research. I see three things, and very quickly, one is the prospects of implementation research. Uh, when I see EdTech, I see that opportunity. And implementation research is critical because it helps us, it helps to model uh, the, the interventions. It helps us to improve and design and work together in terms of improving something that would work. Two, I see opportunities of randomized control trials uh, including independent and rigorous evaluation of models that work, that could take us, that could provide alternatives in terms of solving education um, uh, problems. And finally, I also see uh, an opportunity for generating and for co-generating uh, evidence of what works in, edu in EdTech and how that works. That is very important in terms of uh, uh, making choices because resources are scarce and therefore trying to establish what has the best effect, the best impact. I think that's a good thing for the policymakers given the context of uh, uh, resource constraints. Back to you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Moses. Dr. Maina. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Maina Wagioko, the head of the Professional Development Center at the Aga Khan Schools. I'm also the project director for Foundation for Learning and um, Knowledge Innovation Exchange, global coordinator covering three countries, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Rwanda. So for me, what excites me is the dynamic and the diverse nature of EdTech because things come, keep on changing and uh, also the community where we are implementing and the people who are working also are diverse and dynamic. So those trying to identify a way to adapt and have an innovative fit is what excites me because we have evidence-based, evidence-driven, but is it evidence-proven? So being able to get that identification, is it evidence-proven for this particular community and how does it fit for purpose? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Dr. Might. Yeah, my name is Might Kojuabre, and I'm the senior research fellow in the center, in the Institute for Educational Planning and Administration in the University of Cape Coast. At the same time, I had a grant and consultancy and a visiting fellow with the Center for Global Development. So I, I think on the subject of um, the issue you have raised, the marriage between edtech and research uh, is a very fundamental one because we know edtechs are driven by technology and innovation. And as much as innovation comes to the picture, the subject of research will definitely underpin it. And so the hope of innovation that needs to occur needs to be under, underpinned by uh, research. So that marriage is there. The second thing is the fact that there is that form of scientific co-creation whenever researchers and uh, ed tech fellows come together. And so whatever is, is re research into whatever is designed is typically underpinned by what do the people need, what to serve the people, what to bring about efficiency and effectiveness and all that. But more importantly, whenever research and entrepreneurship and ed tech come together, the most important thing is what they communicate to the general public. So be it the, um, the stakeholders who receive, um, who are the receive recipient, who are the funders, who are the designers, there is that form of communication of at one level or the other. And so these three parameters are things that in my reflections feed into the relationship between EdTech and um, researchers. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike. So we've heard from the researchers, there's 
uh, an exciting methodological opportunity. There's an ex um, there's a dynamic and diverse ecosystem to engage with, uh, and there's a lot to communicate as well. I now like to introduce our entrepreneurs, and uh, once again, I'm going to ask you each to briefly introduce yourself and say what is your motivation for engaging with research. And I'm going to first turn to Chiku, and then over to Nat. Thank you, Lucy, and hi, everyone. I'm not sure I classify as an entrepreneur, but let's go with that for this session. I work with the EdTech Hub, and I co-lead on our portfolio of work in Kenya, which includes the research that we conduct um, and the work that we do to make sure that that research gets into the right hands, be it development partners, governments, or entrepreneurs when they're designing their interventions. I think I'll go back to what Dr. Might said. I think the opportunity that, that's really attractive for me is co-creation and research being the vehicle through which the people on the ground that are utilizing um, the interventions that we're trying to deploy can have a voice in how we design our interventions. I think another thing that's key is oftentimes when you're the implementer, you don't, you don't know too much about the education or the pedagogy side of things. And so I feel like that's another area where research helps to inform the innovation and the tech with, you know, um, evidence that can make it work for whoever it is that we're trying to design for. I think I'll leave it there and pass to Nat. Thanks, Jiku. Um, I'm Nat, I'm Partnerships Lead at One Billion, um, and we're a nonprofit developer of uh, comprehensive ed tech solutions for children learning to read and write. Um, we see research as absolutely critical for bringing change um, and a few things that occur to me. One really at a very early stage is to validate that um, that the solution is is worth pursuing at all or should it just be thrown away and <laughs> start again. And then I think as you know, as we continue as software developers to develop the solution, research has been really important for evaluating whether and how that solution delivers uh, most effectively as we continue to iterate it and test new implementation models. Um, and I think we've also certainly seen that having really high quality and you know, high fidelity research, um, sort of gold standard peer reviewed, is an incredibly powerful argument for bringing on uh, you know, donors and other adopters. Um, but Chico, I would also completely agree with your point that um, for us, it's also access to a lot of expertise that researchers have that we may not have ourselves in house that yeah, we can really benefit from. Wonderful. Thank you, Chico, and that. And actually, I might stay with um, our practitioners for a moment and say, um, first to you, Nat. Um, there's this kind of bewildering range of research methods out there. Um, and as you say, you're kind of not expert in that background. So how do you go about navigating what approach fits best for your organization? Yeah, really good question. Absolutely, I'm not, I'm not an expert at all in this. I think uh, part critical to this is having um, you know, a research partner that you can have a very transparent an honest um, conversation with um, and both establish what it is you're really trying to look into. And then ideally the research will be able to advise what the best, uh, yeah, most appropriate method is. But I think from our side, we always start um, with the thought that um, let's use the smallest sample possible to get actionable results. Um, and partly that's because of course we can do that more, perhaps more quickly and with less investment, but also, um, you know, we obviously respect that uh, the participants, in our case, the children who are going to participate in the research aren't, you know, they're not guinea pigs. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're not just using vast um, or including vast numbers of children when we can do something very actionable with a very small number. Um, but I think, I mean, throughout the looking back at the various um, research projects that have been done on our software and they are many they're also very varied and they have been sort of suited to the different things we were looking at at the time um just as a quick example when we worked with the edtech hub 
in our sandbox, which was very sort of quick, rapid, on the ground. Um, it was that was particularly useful because at the time we were looking at transitioning from big scale to massive scale and particularly developing a sort of implementation plan for the government in Malawi. Um, so really what we were interested in there particularly was challenging any assumptions we may have or that anyone else may have um, that might have sort of posed a barrier to scale. Um, one of them was around how teachers would interact with the software or the, well, the, the concept. Um, so even just with a sort of dozen or a couple of dozen interviews with teachers that were, again, really quick, delivered in context, um, you know, with teachers who were sort of somewhat familiar with what we were doing, we were able to quite quickly identify whether we were going in the right direction or, you know, completely off track. Fantastic. Thank you, Nat. And but if I could pick that up with you, Moses, um, what is the best time? What's the best moment for a researcher to be engaging with an entrepreneur as they're developing a product? And or do you, from the research side, have that conversation about methodology? Um, thank you, um, Lucy, for that. A very, very good and critical question. Uh, and I would say that um, the best time, the little optimal time is at the conceptualization stage. I say this because uh, there are certain research methods and approaches that would require an intervention or a design be designed in a certain way. So if those kind of research approaches that you want to use uh, dictate that the design moves in a certain way so that you are able to have a rigorous evaluation, then the conceptualization uh, stage becomes uh, the optimal time to engage. But having said that, it's never too late. And the researchers do have uh, different ways of going around should they not have been involved at the at the initial stage. So it's never too late and researchers can come in and use, for example, statistical, some statistical methods, quasi-experimental methods and other approaches that could be used to again, generate data that is uh, robust, that is quality enough to be used to make decisions. But as I said, the conceptualization stage would be the optimal uh, time to engage. Back to you. Thank you, Moses. And Mayna, thinking about those different points at which you might start an engagement with a practitioner, how do you involve entrepreneurs in, in your research so that you ensure co-ownership? I think, first of all, you need to understand why they have created this solution and what they intend to do. Because once you get their perspective, and as Shiko had said earlier, sometimes their perspective is more from the business side. It does not have the pedagogical element. So once you know that, you might be able to guide them. Because, for example, there's they, a, a solution which was designed for literacy. But when you drill deeper, it was lacking a lot of uh, pedagogical aspect of it. So by talking to them, they realized there was an issue because as much as it was being fronted, it was not based on a rigorous uh, pedagogical uh, foundation. So as researchers, we were able to guide on how to work and then they saw the reason why we are coming on board and they were able now to work with us. So they need to see value. Why are you coming on board? What intention do you want to add value toward their solution? Is it from the part of implementation, part of impact, or part of them to review it to make it more favorable to what they intend to do? So they have to see what is it in for them in terms of purpose, in terms of impact, in terms of efficiency. Fantastic. Thank you. And so, yes, I think it's really that important, that kind of what's in it for them. Point. And um, maybe Chico, I could ask you um, what on the practitioner side do you recommend uh, the practitioner focuses on to ensure that the outcomes of an evaluation are actionable? 
I think I'll just reiterate um, what uh, Dr. Moses said. When you get the idea, go to research um, and let them be a part of your conceptualization. But then also, and maybe this is now with my sandbox hat on, and maybe Nat can speak to the value that this has had for one billion is embrace, embrace experimentation. Mm -hmm. and be ready to test some of those assumptions because oftentimes we think we have an idea of what it is we are trying to solve but when we go on the ground and begin to do different kinds of tests we realize that actually there was an, there was another hidden symptom that if we addressed could solve a lot of other issues so yes one keep your researchers close so develop a relationship with the, with research that allows you to learn from them even as they learn from you as you as you implement but then also embrace experimentation especially if as you said um not if you're thinking of moving from skill to massive skill there's a lot of things that you need to understand along the journey a lot of things you need to take as you go along um to ensure that whatever it is you're trying to solve for is solved in an you know in a way that's also sustainable and equitable Would you like to come in on that, Nat? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, I think um, there's so much. I mean, we, we've been very lucky, I think, with all, with so many of the research partners we've had as well, that they, in so many cases, have been able to point us to other researchers who may have a particular area of expertise in, in something that, that even they don't. So, I mean, perhaps we're quite lucky, but we we found that there's a great sort of willingness to share knowledge and sort of um, you know, promote each other's um, areas of expertise for the benefit of well, yeah, for the benefit of uh, solving learning poverty, I suppose, in our case. Thank you, Nat. And actually, maybe to this point around how needs change as um, an intervention evolves and develops. Mike, can I ask you, how do you think about that kind of change management as you work in partnership with an implementer? Yeah, I, I think um, change management is a very important um, consideration to be had in the area of a relationship because um, entrepreneurs and tech experts have their philosophy of work and they've stayed in that comfort for a long time. Typically, researchers come with a varied lens as well. This for co-creation to happen, co-development to happen, user, user um, utility to be tested and all that require them to come to a common platform, making them a bit move away from their comfort zone to a unique independent platform for engagement, which will require some form of change management to be able to manage such relationships. Typically at the design stages of a relationship of a project, the implementation stages of a project, the redesign stages, the M&E stages of the project. These are all typical stages of the project, the relationship, the crew creation that require that certain level of managing relationships happens. And if properly uh, in undertaken with the support of change management, I think it leads to productive ends. And so um, the issue of change management is something that certainly needs to be looked at. So it feels like uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of diplomacy involved on both sides for the um, practitioner and for the researcher. And um, maybe if I can ask a cheeky question, Mayna, have you ever had to uh, tell someone that their their innovation, their beloved model, doesn't work? And how how did you handle that? You see, as researchers, we come with evidence on the table, but uh, we also have to balance expectations because most of the entrepreneurs, they believe in their product to the hilt, and therefore they only see their product, but the advantage for researchers, we have variations and we have been exposed to different solutions. And therefore, when I've come to such a situation where, <laughs> it's not working, I begin by presenting the findings, which very objectively and uh, handling, managing expectation and being also careful because I know they believe on their product, they know it works, 
But then I play the card that maybe it worked elsewhere. And now you have a different context. You have a different population. You have a different curriculum. So we come with that, but candidly, everything is laid on the table why it's not working. So I've had such situation where I've really had to say, this is what it is. And sometimes it gets heated up and, uh, but you see, that's the reality because maybe it's not the product itself, but it's how it's being used. Maybe it's not the product itself, but it is which curriculum is being applied on. So it's good to align all the dots and be clear. Why did you find it's not working, but also be plain and candid in terms of the way you give the information. I know emotions arise, anxiety and worry, but that's how it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, given that the importance of that relationship and relational fit, um, Chico, if you've looked across quite a lot of these um, research collaborations, how would you recommend a practitioner go about finding a good um, a good research partner? Just so uh, my colleague Jennifer put that in the chat as well, and I was trying to figure out if I have an answer. I think understanding what you're trying to solve for as a practitioner will guide you to a researcher that's an expert in that area. I don't know where they are found. I think I remember us having a conversation at an event in Tanzania last year. We were saying maybe we do need to have like kind of like a database of researchers and their expertise that practitioners can pick from. So I don't know where you would find them, but I think being clear on what you're trying to solve for, is it um, foundational literacy? Are you working with teachers um, on, and on what area? And who do you know in your community that has been able to do that? I think the, the thing about building relationships, especially in the education space, let me speak for Kenya, I don't think the space is that wide, is if you build relationships with different people, then it's very easy to be able to get information on who's doing what and who is good at what. So I would say at the core of everything really, um, of finding the researcher and maintaining some of those relationships of you know, being able to come to a forum such as this one where I know that I can reach out to somebody and ask, maybe I could, I could reach out to Nat, a fellow practitioner and ask, I know you were trying to solve for X, who, who have you used? So kind of that, um, you know, relationship building within the, the ecosystem, I feel like that's the best answer I can give. The, other, the, the, short, the short version is I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Chico. And I... I've actually just put in the chat a resource that people could use to um, search. For, it's Africa focused, but search for relevant um, research in that area. But I, you need a bit of luck as well as method, I think, for that relationship to work. Um, now, we've talked a lot about researchers and we've talked a lot about practitioners. Um, Moses, I wanted to ask you, who else? should we be thinking about in terms of successful edtech research collaborations? Uh, thank you, Lucy. Good question. Uh, who else should we think about in this uh, equation? Uh, I will look at it uh, from um, uh, a relationship point of view and also an evidence use point of view. You have the implementer, you have the researcher, but you realize that when the evidence comes out, when the model is designed and it is working or otherwise, then what? So when we answer that question, then we realize, hey, we need uh, the person to scale it up. We need uh, a consumer. And many times that consumer ends up being the uh, policy actors and policy stakeholders. For example, in the case of the education sector, then you'll find, for example, Ministry of Education, you'll find subnational governments, you'll find other stakeholders that are consuming both the edtech model, the tool, as well as the evidence, if it works, because you will need them to input that into the uh, system. So within this relationship, then we'll need those policy actors to be part and parcel of the um, of the discussion and of the relationship, 
mainly because you you at the end of the day you'll have to think about scaling it up you'll have to think about uh, sustainability you'll have to think about exit strategy so when you think about all this during the planning stage then you realize that you'll not leave that that partner who is very very critical back to you lucy Thank you. That's really so interesting. So we have then the policymaker, as well as the researcher, as well as the implementer. And we've talked also about research as a potential route for elevating the voice of learners and other people in the school system. Um, there's a lot of power dynamics going on there that might be explicit or implicit. And might I wanted to ask you, have you come across those power dynamics in your in your work and and how have you dealt with those? Yeah, I think the issue of power dynamics is a key um, issue when it comes to uh, words like this in the edtech and researcher space. The fact remains that researchers are not all true and true. There are specialists in conception. There are specialists in design. There are specialists in implementation. There are specialists in monitoring and quality control. And there are specialists in redesign and evaluation. Taking it from that point of view, we get an argument that there are different stages with different expertise and different expectations. There are times when designers feel that people who conceptualize the model got it wrong. Power dynamics may emerge from there. There are times when those considered key actors, key stakeholders, key consultants in the process see themselves over and above the middleman, the lower tier rank who contribute one form of research or um, you know, um, literature review or something to the process. Those power dynamics are things that need to be managed from the onset. And indeed, in relation to the issue we talked about, change management, these are models that need to come. And typically from the inception of conception through to redesign and enhancing and um, indeed scaling out and embedding, there is need to continuously retool how these relationships are managed because it has implication for productivity, the longevity of the project, the design, and the relationship thereafter. So these are quite pertinent issues that ought to be looked at at these key stages of relationship that need to be managed in the EdTech research aspects. Thank you, Might. Um, Nat, you're nodding. Is that something that you've seen come up as you've been um, doing all sorts of different types of research across your innovations? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I completely agree. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, just to, um, to yeah, to to add to it as well. I mean, I think, uh, I, I mean, this is not um, something we've seen personally, I don't think, but you can see situations in terms of these power dynamics. Um, I mean, we, uh, as practitioners, there are sometimes things that we feel need to be researched or it would be really beneficial to research them but they might be not very popular ideas or they might conflict quite a lot with, um, you know, sort of uh, accepted thinking. And if you are not the one in control of um, you know, the budget, if you're not the one actually commissioning it yourself, then of course, sometimes there might be, um, it might be quite hard to persuade uh, whoever is in charge of that, whether it's the researcher or somebody behind it, um, to take a bit of a risk and look into that particular thing. So it's, I think sometimes, I mean, Perhaps going back to Moses's point, actually, about there being a, almost a bit more of an ecosystem, more people in the mix to kind of scrutinize um, a research project. I think that can also be beneficial from the point of view of making sure that um, voices, which may be sometimes quite small because they don't have, they're not bringing the money, you know, can be heard and perhaps slight, you know, changes to, to what's really being looked into. Because sometimes it can be the you know, the sort of far left um, wacky idea that if it if it is shown to deliver can make massive change. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Nat. I'm conscious that we're nearing the end of our time slot for panel conversation. And we've talked a lot about challenges and relationship building and how we do that. But I'd like to bring us back to, you know, why we're all here and why we're so excited to see more collaboration between practitioners and edtech um, and uh, education researchers. And so I'd like to go around and ask each one of you, what is, um, can you talk about a positive outcome that you've had that has led from a research collaboration to improved learning for young people um, from, from a research collaboration? And I'm sorry, Nat, I'm gonna immediately pick on you again. Um, so kick us off with a real concrete example, and then I'll go to Moses, Chico, Mite, and Minor. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So from our side, um, relatively recently in the last few years, um, one of our research partners uh, was evaluating a, a very significant software change in our software. We, we now deliver our software in a fully adaptive, personalized way. And previously, years before, we delivered it in a procedural way. So these are two completely different ways for the child to interact with it. And um, before scaling the, you know, well, before scaling the, the iterated version, we really needed to know whether that was better. Um, so our research partner in Malawi conducted uh, you know, rigorous evaluation of the two side by side with you know, significant sample size and control schools. And, um, and the outcome was that the, you know, the new adaptive version was um, at least as good or better. Um, so then we felt you know, confident being able to, to roll that one out, but we didn't, we wouldn't have felt um, you know, sort of ethically confident, of course, doing that before we'd had those results delivered. And obviously, if it had been the other way around, then of course we wouldn't have scaled that version. Fantastic. That's a great example. Thanks, Nat. Moses. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again. Um, I think mine is a mix of uh, many things. And um, the, the, one of the most exciting randomized control trial that uh, I've ever led and uh, uh, with my team, uh, with our implementation partner, was on a pedagogical model or instructional model to improve uh, foundational literacy and numeracy for age four to five to make them ready to go to um, primary school one. And along the way, and especially during the midline, we realized that um, it's not working. And I know you had earlier on asked the question of how do you communicate those kind of findings? So we found ourselves in that situation where we have to communicate that. But of course we did in a diplomatic way, but as usual, then there are always a back and forth and conversation. Finally, we all agreed that let's go to the field, both sides, implementer in their own direction, our own direction, and let's try to find out uh, why is this the case? And we came back, all of us with some good information shared and we were able to adjust the way things were being implemented. When we went out to do the final results, including conducting cost effectiveness analysis, everything looked very, very good. And uh, you, could, you, could, you could see the energy in the room uh, uh, because of the findings. And uh, of course it was like, Ah, finally, given what we had seen in the in the uh, midline, and given how the tensions were during the mid term, and uh, we were all happy and glad that it was working. It is one, arguably one of the largest uh, randomized control trials that I've ever been engaged in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 600 uh, uh, schools. And, and the, what was exciting and very, very exciting about that is working with the implementer. Uh, trying to communicate very difficult uh, results. And at the end of it all being taken positively and being used to improve and to adjust the way things are being done. And then finally coming to the end and seeing, yes, it's actually working. That to me was very, very good. And it's a very, very good example of relationship building, working together, how results can turn in all different directions. But remember at the end of the day, is when you communicate this to the policy audience, you want to communicate and to be sure that this works because they are gonna scare it up. And if they're scaring something that doesn't work, you can imagine the amount of resources, which we don't have the luxury for, 
or you can imagine the amount of resources that can be uh, lost uh, by scaling up something that the opposite is of course the, the 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 case scaling up something that works is very 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 good because of the positive impact that it could have back to you Luz. Thank you, Moses. And I, I think that's the upside of you know, all the hard work and relationship building that it takes. Actually, I can hear the emotion in your voice, Moses, when it works. That's just a wonderful feeling. Um, Chico. I think mine is a work in progress. So if we ever have this again next year, I will update with final results. But we have we, we have a, an interesting study that we are conducting. So now I don't even know, I'm speaking from both ends, from the researcher to the practitioner. But we're working with uh, an implementer who is implementing a, a solution around um, numeracy and literacy. And we are conducting an RCT alongside them, um, as well as a sandbox. And I think it's been really exciting to see the trust that we've built. I think we've talked about this before is as an implementer, one of the things that's top of mind is time and cost. Yeah. So I want to learn, but I don't want to take too long to learn because if I take too long to learn that my solution will not be viable by the time I say that I'm going to implement it. And then also, um, will what I learn increase the cost and so not make it cost effective. So it's been interesting to be able to, to kind of adjust, especially around um, equity because I think that that was really, really important. We just don't want to implement and not have everybody have good access to something that could benefit and improve their foundational literacy. So I think that's one of the things that's changed that maybe because of a lack of understanding of impact of a certain way of implementation um, has, been, has been really positive that now we know that a lot more children can use the tool. As I said, we are, we're doing the RCT now, so I will check back. But I think being able to also track the progress in the journey as we wait for the larger results is also really exciting for me. And also be, you know, being able to prove that those kinds of relationships do work and that they're valuable. So yeah, it's, it's an exciting That's project right. to be a part of. Thanks so much for sharing, Chico. And we'll definitely, uh, well, well, watch this space. We'll, be, we'll come back. Um, so, I, I realize I haven't been as disciplined on time as I should have been. So I'll ask um, uh, our last two contributors to be relatively brief, but um, over to you, Mike. Yeah, so I, I think um, the example I was citing in the interest of time will be the work we did some 13 years ago on the teacher education in Sub-Saharan Africa project. Uh, the project was an open educational resource project and that project we want to hit the heart of teachers and their learners very well and to have ready-made resources available to them that they can engage, re-engage to and read to to use in their schools. But one interesting side that is a positive one we picked was when we wanted to move away from only English to French and other countries, that was where true collaboration came between researchers and um, the developers. Because at that point, versioning of resources, versioning of um, apps and all that needed to take into consideration the language dynamics, the cultural ethos, the technological capabilities, um, the sensitivities of you know, um, communication, gestures and all that were things that needed to be taken on board. And the true partnerships that were fostered to be able to scale those barriers. The innovations we did in trying to communicate all these were things that were so positive in how it all rolled out that we were able to get Portuguese on board and we French on board was so massive, um, a positive in outcome of that relationship that are good examples for people considering proper and uh, um, exemplary partnership between researchers and uh, developers for that matter. Oh, fantastic. That's so rare, that kind of collaboration. What an achievement. Um, so then last word over to Mena. Oh, you're on mute. I'll set an example where we worked on a longitudinal study for literacy acquisition using technology. And during our POC, we I, we, we were successful in terms of identifying learning gains with the learners, but when we did a deep dive in 
looking at the design, the cost effectiveness was not positive. It was uh, heavy on that. And then when we did the second iteration to see if it's possible, we were able to cut cost in terms of implementation. And then the next study still bore the same results. And at this time, we're also looking at gender in terms of how girls and boys respond to the access to the tool. So the results were very successful because we use the, result, the results to seek for a grant on scaling up. So that, that's when the longitudinal study took like eight years. We are now working on another study where we are trying to identify how do you scale up? And it's still a mystery because we have not got the answer yet. I'm looking forward, looking forward to hearing when we uh, when you do get the answer. Um, so Sylvia, apologies for going over time, but back to you. Thank you. Oh, I should say thank you so much for all the to all the panelists. That was a brilliant conversation. Yeah, no worries at all. And yeah, thank you. That was amazing. Uh, we're going to go into sort of a Q and A section right now. Throughout the panel, we had some great questions and reflections come through the chat. Uh, we have a couple of questions from Rosaline and Jennifer. Uh, Rosaline, would you like um, to uh, speak up and um, ask your question? Or I, I can also read it out, uh, whatever you prefer, if you're there. I think I'll take that, I'll just read the question. So uh, Rosaline was asking, um, what are some strategies for edtech startups to manage the power dynamics mentioned by Dr. Might? Um, so yeah, I don't know if Might or someone else would like to take on this question, but over to you. Lucy, would you want me to have a go? Yes, please. Right, so in terms of managing the power dynamics, I think um, the solution has been gotten from the change management we talked about. Typically for all projects, the risk assessment needs to be done and the mitigation strategies need to be set from the word go. As one envisage that this is a possible thing that can occur in the life of the project, robust design needs to be put in place in terms of how to manage this um, power dynamics which may emerge. Number two, there could be organizational culture, project culture that will be designed from the, way, from the beginning that guide all members who sign up to support the process to respect some organizational ethos that will support appropriate and um, developmental intervention design implementation. So the policy on that is a very good thing to do from the beginning. Number three, continuous professional development and, and reflection sections will offer opportunities for people to engage on social platforms that allow their work to come together. Typically, the one who does the coding, the one who does the building, the, the one who does the market testing, all their roles come together to form their fine product that can be award-winning. And therefore, if some of these four reflections are shared, uh, anything to go by, then these are some possible solutions to managing the power dynamics that may emerge along the line. Amazing, thank you, Mike. Uh, we also have another question from Jennifer that I'm going to read out. Um, some of the languages of research can be a bit scary or overwhelming for practitioners, uh, for example, quasi-experimental, etc. In the experience of researchers, What's the best way to help build a common language for the methods and practices needed for edtech research? How can practitioners best upskill themselves? And I'd hand over that to Moses, maybe, if you like, or anyone else that'd like to answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, and thank you, Jennifer. I think that's a very valid um, question because sometimes we use very heavy uh, jargon. Uh, that probably is not familiar to those who are not within the sector. And uh, we needed to unpack it, we needed to make it simple, uh, we need to communicate um, with each other. So what we uh, advise and what uh, uh, teams are usually advised to do, research teams, is well, they can go ahead and uh, use the jargon at some point, but at the point of communicating, 
with others. For the point of communicating and telling others what the results are all about, what is it that they are doing, what approaches they are, do, they are, they are taking, then they may want it to pass that kind of a document to, uh, to a communication person, to, to an editor, so that even when they are not able to break it down into uh, language that uh, any other user would be, would be able to be comfortable with or to understand, then they are helped and supported by that kind of uh, expertise to do that. So there are ways, and that could be one way of uh, making ensuring that uh, communication happens. There could be other ways that researchers use to, to do that. And it's not only research, I think it's, it's, it's both way. I'm sure in... Um, in, in, in EdTech, uh, there are a lot of terminologies that probably may not be very, very familiar with, uh, with, with the researchers. So I think utilizing that expertise becomes very, very critical. Back to you, uh, Sylvia. Great, thank but, you. But just, uh, uh, that this, I wanted uh, to add something small to it, Sylvia, sorry. Um, regarding how practitioners can best upskill uh, themselves, I think it's very important practitioners become more proactive than we have known them to be. In major conferences, we hear the voice of researchers who come and produce some 30 minute speech and show us some slide and the world should come to an end. But that's not what moves science. What moves science is what we really see and what really affects our life. So if you come and give me alpha values and the level of significance and all that, and you think that mountain should move, it will not move as it were. So we should get to that point where the provocative display of what is really coming from the builders, the scientists, the innovators must come to. So I'm imagining in the next couple of years, I'll go to a whole conference for three days and I'll hear no one speak to me, but I'll be following five minute videos from one point to the other. That is livid, that is vivid, that is classic, and that will be something that will saturate the mind more than a, a presentation can do, because that five minutes would have been a well thought out five minutes video that would be so impactful. Over. Amazing. Thank you, Mike. Uh, great. We're going to wrap up soon, but before we do that, I just want to check if there is anyone that has uh, a question that they would like to ask just uh, and just unmute themselves. All right, I think I think that might be it. Um, okay, so well, I mean, before we wrap up, um, I just wanted to give a chance to everyone to let us know what were what was the highlight, what was your main takeaway uh, from the session. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a second to do that, and please do share it in the chat or feel free to also unmute yourselves. Uh, what stood out to me in particular was that basically what sits at the core of having like an effective collaboration between research and implementation is relationships and it's, it is networks and it's that ability to communicate and to know how to navigate the ethic uh, ecosystem. And that stood out to me because the very reason for this community to exist is to support uh, those connections, is to be able to, so that we can, you know, give you the opportunity to uh, spot opportunities uh, for partnership in this, um, ecosystem. So yeah, it was just like a great validation of that and just a great message for you all to sort of like have reinforced um, since you are part of this community. Um, so yeah, uh, let me open the chat. Um, oh yeah, we've got some uh, takeaways. Um, again, if you'd like to unmute yourselves and speak out, please do. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Brian Lee, I'm glad that that resonates um, with you as well. Collab uh, relationships and collaborations are key. Um, Dr. Miner, would you like to uh, say something about what you uh, wrote in the chat? Yeah, I, I think it, it's clear that the impact of collaboration among the players. And uh, from this conversation, there is a breadth in terms of players. It's not just researchers and uh, entrepreneurs, but the, there's a broader scope of who should come on board but also balancing the expectations, the politics, and uh, all these other nuances that come on board. So we need to be sensitive to all that so that we are effective in building the relationship. That came out very clearly for me. Amazing, thank you. And Lucy, you said something too. Would you like to? Yeah, minutes. Just repeating what I said before. I mean, the highlight for me was just 
the joy of all the panelists in um, talking about what can be really achieved through those collaborations with between researchers and practitioners. And it's hard work and it's complicated. There's a lot to think about, but there's so much to be achieved through that. Great. And yeah, and I see a theme in the last two messages in the chat that trust is also a big one. Uh, Moses, would you like to say something to that? Oh, okay, Sylvia, thank you. Yes, uh, trust, I think is very, very critical, very, very important so that uh, both sides, the collaborators, the partners know that uh, we are there together and we are all doing it for the good of each other. And the building that it trust, then uh, you, you, you start minimizing the power dynamics, whatever they are trust, you start minimizing um, any friction that could uh, happen along the way. And the management of the whole process becomes very, very easy, whatever there is trust. In other words, approach it from a human uh, centered design kind of, a, kind of approach uh, so that you know that it's people that you are dealing with here and that uh, you need each of each of those people is needed for for success to be realized i think and, and that's where the, the the trust building becomes uh, very very critical and important back to you silver amazing well i'm gonna wrap it up here as we're on time well i just wanted to say thank you uh, to everyone thank you to the panelists that were here thank you lucy for moderating it uh, thank you all for your contributions and for the great considerations and questions in the chat as well. Um, I hope that this discussion has sparked some sort of like inspiration on how to use research, how to go about uh, implementing it in your work, and that it sparked some ideas for collaboration as well within um, our EdTech community. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thank you all for joining us today. It's been a pleasure and please keep an eye on our inbox for future opportunities and we'll see you at the next one. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.